to James chapter 1. We know that a healthy church is a growing church, and we want uh, God to use us. We want God to increase, not so we can say all the chairs are filled, but that we can see the kingdom expanded so more people can be saved. If we can save people on this list of eight, all of a sudden, now we will have people uh, on their list of eight that can get saved. So we will continue to, um, to expand, and we just want people not to go to hell, amen? We just want to get to where people don't want to go to hell, that we love them so much and we show them so much love of Jesus, they just say, hey, I just don't want to go to hell. So uh, we, we want to we see uh, the fruits of our labor. So James chapter 1, I want to look tonight over a few minutes over a healthy church and problems. Maybe how a healthy church should handle problems. Because believe it or not, uh, there is no such thing as a perfect church. I think we have near perfect at our church. But uh, we are all made up of imperfect people. And, and, and because of that, uh, there is, th if you want to find flaws, you can find flaws in every church there is. Go to the biggest mega church and you'll find flaws. Go to the, to the smallest country church, you'll find flaws because we are flawed people. But just because of that, does not, we should not excuse weird, bad behaviors because of uh, being flawed. Because we're, we're going to be taught how to do that. So James, who's um, the brother of the Lord Jesus writes, if everybody found this in the book of James, chapter number one, let's pray. Father, I thank you for the opportunity to, to be able to uh, teach your word. God, I thank you for revelation, and I pray, God, that you'd help us to, to grow, help us to inspect our lives. God, if there's things in us that needs to be changed, then let us change them. Let us not be so boastful so prideful that we can't recognize things in our own lives that need to be altered. So, Lord, we want to alter any and everything so that we can live healthy, whole lives and that we as a corporate body will be a healthy church growing and thriving. Do it, I pray, in Jesus' name. Amen. James chapter 1. I'm going to begin reading in verse number 2. Let's read verse 2 through 8. It says, My brethren, count it all joy... When you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. Well, you could teach a lot on that. Verse 5, if any of you lack wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Verse 6, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. For he who doubts is like a wave of the sea driven and tossed by the wind. For let not that man suppose that he will receive anything from the Lord. He is a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. When you become a Christian, uh, it is a myth to believe that all your problems are going to be gone. It, it's a myth to think you're never going to have sad days, depressed days, angry days. It's a myth to think you're never going to be in a fight with somebody. It, it, you're, you're not going to be trouble-free when you get saved. But God does help us to know how to handle the trouble. And as you mature in Christ, and as a church matures in its walk with Christ, then we should be able to see uh, a response out of our hearts differently than when it was when we were sinners. Uh, therefore, because we're not excluded from difficulties, it is important that we have the proper attitude when we meet adversity. Because you're going to meet adversity. A as we begin to check off names on this list, we're going to meet adversity. When you begin to witness and your husband begins to feel conviction because we're praying for him every day, you're going to meet adversity. And how you meet adversity will be a reflection of where you are with Christ. And you can, uh oh, this is dangerous. You can ruin your testimony by the way you handle adversity. You can blow all your times of testifying to somebody when you mishandle adversity. You can also be very, and I don't like to use the word impressive, but you can also be pretty impressive. You can really impress people by the way you handle it the right way. In other words, you can show them Jesus or you can show them some devil. We don't want to show them no devil. So the Bible says, James says, hey, count it all joy. Count it all joy. Be deliberate. Have an intellectual appraisal of the situation. 
from God's perspective. View trials as means of a moral and a spiritual growth. When you are going through some junk, step back, ask God to help you see from his perspective and realize the suffering you're in, realize the trial that you're in, the fight that you're in, that there's possibility for moral and spiritual growth, that you're going to come out of this adversity better than you went into it. You're going to come out with a great, greater foundation of who you are in Christ. You'll grow out with a greater attitude of Christ and, and uh, you, you will separate yourself from those things that have always pulled you down. There's a separation that comes through adversity. Now listen, we don't really have to rejoice in the trials. When I'm being stabbed, I don't go, Woo, thank you, God, I'm being stabbed in the back. Hallelujah for the knives that are penetrating my... No, 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 no. We rejoice in the fact of the possible results. Hey, devil, I feel every hurtful, harmful blow, but I'm coming out stronger, healthier, wiser, more anointed. you trying to stop me. you trying to kill me. you trying to derail me. You're trying to kill my family. But I thank you that through this suffering, we're going to see my family saved. I'm going to walk out whole. I'm going to walk out anointed. You tried to destroy the church. You tried to destroy the ministry. But we're about to move into a new season with our greater anointed and a greater uh, uh, re revelation. Hey, rejoice because of what God's going to do in you through your adversity. Amen. We were talking, those of us who went to the, uh, the North Georgia Day of Prayer, anytime you get to go to that, oh, man, it's worth the three hours we spend in church. Bob Sorge, uh, the preacher that cannot pre speak, uh, wow, I, we were talking at lunch he was a piano player, worship leader, and a pastor. Do He does what I do, but he injured his voice and could not speak. And everything he knew was stopped. And it's amazing. He made a comment, and I don't know if anybody else caught it. He said, when this was gone, writing opened up. And he's written all kind of books now. I don't know. He had a whole display table full of books. And I told somebody, because he handled his adversity well... He's been elevated to a place he probably would have never been elevated to had he not gone through his adversity. Had he not lost his voice, he probably would not be traveling the world preaching. But because he handled his suffering correctly, and do you know what he did? He handled it in the Word. He got in, he pled to God, he begged to God, he, he studied God, he studied the glory, he studied suffering, he studied, he studied, he studied, he invested in the Word. And because he handled his suffering right, God was able to elevate him. You see, you're suffering, the devil may intend it to kill you, but God is going to use it to promote you. So count it all joy, amen? When you're tested and trialed, tried, you know the testing of your faith produces patience. Let endurance have its perfect work. Let's patient have its perfect work producing results. Hit, watch this, suffering eventually leads to perfecting. Boy, I'm going to say that again. Suffering leads to perfecting. You'll never be a perfected saint if you ain't gone through some stuff. If you've not gone through some suffering, if you've not gone through some times where you've had to lament and you've mourned and you've cried out, oh God, where are you like David? God, where are you ever going to answer me off this backside of this mountain? God, why is my, what in the world? God, did you really choose me to be king? Did you choose the wrong son? I don't know why. I'm hiding out in the cave. I'm separated from everybody. I got a few old bandits out here trying to protect me. God, surely this ain't the life of a famous king. But because he went through that, God was able to perfect him. James says it is that faith that begins to bring a perfecting of the saints. And then James says something. If anybody lack wisdom, why don't you ask for it? <laughs> I mean, wow. The Bible also says to study to show yourself approved, a workman not needing to be hired. But listen, you need to make sure you begin to seek the scripture for wisdom. And if you don't know how to handle a problem, if you don't know how to handle adversity, if you're not doing well with your trial, then here's what you do. Jesus, I'm asking you to give me wisdom to know how to deal with Sister Lulu. I need you to give me wisdom on how to handle Sam. God, I need you to give me wisdom on how to handle this season. 
I'm reading a book, and I, I'm so sorry, I can't remember the name of it. Um, I will try to put it in the bulletin of one of the books that I'm reading. It is talking about waiting. And, and, and it's written by a lady, and I think it's probably written for ladies. I guess she forgot men may need to learn about waiting as well. But she's going through the, all these famous people in the Bible that before they ever arrived to their right place, they had to go through a season of prolonged waiting. And it's hard to wait. And while you're in the middle of waiting, ask God to give you wisdom. Because the Bible says, James says, hey, my brother's going to give it to you abundantly, liberally. If you'll ask him in faith without doubting, God will pour so much wisdom on you. You'll know how to, to handle problems and handle adversity. Now, don't ask God with doubt. Don't begin to ask God with your mind wavering and, and you're going through gulfs and highs and lows and ebbs and the flows of all the doubt. No, ask God believing that God is the God of his word and that he will give it to you. Now listen, remember there's a time in the Bible when the, Jesus was talking to a man and the man says, Jesus says, well, if you do, if you'll believe, I can do it. And the man says, oh, I believe, but oh, God, help my unbelief. Oh, I have to pray that sometimes because waiting, when you're in a season of waiting, man, it will cause you to doubt. When you're in a transition, woo, and I guess waiting is a, is a form of transition, but when you're going through that molding, remolding, rebuilding, oh, that, that, that scrape down and that putting back together, that eaglet or that eagle scraping his claws off, pucking his feathers out, baking, breaking his bill off, when you're going through that, that molting process before your feathers come back, before your talons grow out, before your beak grows out, before you, fl oh my goodness, that transition Oh, that's the time you got to say, God, help my unbelief. But God, there's too much for you to give me if I only have faith in you. So when you go, a healthy church in the middle of facing problems are going to do everything they can to stay grounded. Stay grounded. James says a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways. A double-minded man is a man who has divided loyalty. He's unstable. He's undecided. Choose you this day whom you will serve. Make your mind up. Choose. You, you're going to serve God. You're going to serve the church. You're going to get committed. A double-minded man is going to be blown by any kind of any kind of fancy thrill. The wind blows, and there they go. Oh, the, the, their sound doctrine is, is not very sound because they're so double-minded. you got to get focused. A healthy church knows what they believe in. They know why they believe it, and they're grounded in what they believe in. A healthy church cannot be double-minded. Amen. A healthy church, or let me say this, an unhealthy church that is double-minded, it don't take much for them to be led astray. doesn't take much for a false prophet to fill them full of lies. And before long, they're believing lies. And then a few months, few years later, the church is nothing but a skeleton because they were not grounded. Stay grounded. Amen. Choose whom you will serve. Let's look on down. I told you I'm going to skip verses. So I want to go now to verse 19. Chapter 1, verse 19. Why then, my beloved brethren, let every man be swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to wrath, for the wrath of man does not produce the righteousness of God. <laughs> I'm going to pause right there on that one verse before I go to the next one. And all of us are getting nervous. And I guess a lot of people knew I was going to cover this scripture tonight, so they stayed home. I pray they're drawn to Facebook and they're going to watch it. A sign of a healthy church, a sign of a healthy Christian, you listen more than you speak. Oh, Jesus, help me. You're swift to hear, slow to speak. Let's just pause right there. I'm a fixer. I want to fix. God gives me wisdom to help fix. But that doesn't mean I need to stop start talking before you stop talking. <laughs> Listen, and I had to learn this in my marriage, by the way, Sunday nights, marriage together, you need, we'll probably recover this, because I had to learn at times my wife was not done talking. And my wife does not appreciate when I try to give her the answer before she's done talking. 
As a matter of fact, I'm not even sure she wants my answers when she's done talking. Sometimes she just wants to talk. And it's all right. A healthy person, a healthy Christian must learn how to hold your peace. Sometimes Christians like to impress people with their knowledge or their wisdom or their anointing or their ability. And James is saying, hush your mouth, just listen. A healthy Christian knows how to listen. You're swift to hear, you're slow to speak. Now, when you begin slow to speak, it doesn't mean you speak slowly. <laughs> Take your time. Take your time. When you do speak, let your thoughts organize. Let's say Danny is going to address Emma, who's not her daughter, but is someone. And Danny has all this over. Maybe this is good for a mother-daughter relationship, too. A healthy mother-daughter relationship. Lord, I'm just getting deep tonight. I'm glad Amy's home with a sick child. I bet she is too, honey. You may want to listen to this. So listen. Before you automatically throw up on your child, be slow to speak. Take time. Organize it. Make sure it's right. And then speak. I know as a parent, now Emma, you're about to learn a life lesson that's going to help you love your mama more. Children need to be heard as well. I know we don't want them to be heard. I know we're like, I'm guilty. Just shut up. I don't, don't, don't say shut up. Don't say another word. Anybody else had that conversation with your child? But my, I, I'm going to, no, no, shut up. I don't care. We need to allow them, we need to allow them the ability to be able to speak. Now, if they're being rude, disrespectful, which is normally when we start screaming those things, is that they're, they're crossing the line into a disrespect, and now it's becoming a fight between a mom and a, and a daughter, or son and a father, or son and a mother. That's different. But it's all right to even be swift to listen because they actually may have something they need to say. And before you raise that flag up the flagpole, make sure you take a little time. But now listen what else it says here. A healthy church or a healthy Christian, they're swift to hear, slow to speak. Listen what it says. And slow to wrath. The wrath of man does not produce righteousness. That's what verse 20 says. The wrath of man does not produce righteousness. And I was going to read this from the Passion Translation, and I left my Passion Translation at home. Um, does anybody have, can you pull it up on, can you put somebody, pull up the Passion Translation on your phone and just read verse 19 and 20 real loud from the Passion Translation? Has anybody got that on there? Go ahead, Carrie Beth. A, a man's anger is never a good tool to produce God's righteousness. Listen, a health, let me, let me, an unhealthy church will have wrath where people need love. And we'll beat somebody over the head and we'll rebuke them and we'll, now listen, sometimes some devils need to be rebuked, but sometimes some people need to be loved. And what happens is sometimes we begin to act out of worldly wrath, and that never produces godly character. Now listen, you take this up with James. He's the brother of Jesus. He slept in the bed next to him when they were kids. You take this up with him. Because what I want you to understand is your anger is never going to produce the fruit of love in somebody's heart. So you have to understand, if, you're trying, if we're going to try to produce righteousness in this list of eight... It's going to come not because you're mad with them and you tell them, you're horrible, you're going to hell, you're a loser, you're sorry, you need the word, you need the Holy Ghost, you need, you need, and you're beating them under. That's not going to ever win them. And at one time, Pentecostal's church thought that was the only way to win people. 
And instead of showing them God's love and God's grace, they condemned them and they told them how bad they were, how wrong they were, how they needed to do this, that, and the other. And they gave them a rule sheet of all the things they needed to do. And it never produced righteousness in their life. Because righteousness is birthed out of a loving relationship with the Father. So let's continue reading verse 21. And um, I'll read, let me just read several verses now. Well, maybe not. Verse 21, therefore lay aside all filthiness of the flesh and overflow of wickedness and receive with meekness the implanted word which is able to save your souls. Let's stop there for just a second. A healthy Christian, a healthy church must be willing to lay away, get, get rid of all unclean stuff. We must lay aside all filth and we must absorb God's word. A healthy church is a clean church. A healthy church is a clean church. Because you can, now that doesn't mean we're not going to have sinners come in. We want some dirty folk coming in. But we want them to be washed in the blood, sanctified by the word, filled in the power of the Holy Ghost. But we do that as we begin to absorb God's word. I, when, if I can get you committed to eight weeks of Bible study, I know that will equal nine weeks, 10 weeks, 11 weeks, and before long, 52 weeks will have passed, and you will have 52 weeks of Bible study, and it will ratify and change your life drastically, because when you begin to read daily in the Word, not sporadically, not, oh, oh I forgot all week long, no, 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 I'm talking about you carve out a time. Sit with your Bible, a pen, and a journal, and write and read and let the, you don't got to read, you don't have to try to read the whole Bible in a year, but you need to read daily because as you, as you begin to absorb God's Word, first of all, it's going to show you what is evil. It's going to show you in your life what you need to lay aside, but it's also going to begin to produce fruit in your life. And watch this. It is the meekness of the implanted word which is able to save your souls. We're sanctified by the word. Get in the word. Amen. Let's move on. Because verse 22 can't happen if verse 21 don't happen. If I am not implanting the word, because number 22 says, Be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. For if anyone is a hearer of the word and not a doer, he is like a man observing his natural face in a mirror. Verse 24, for he observes himself going away and immediately he forgets what kind of man he was. But he who looks into the perfect law of liberty and continues in the law or in the word and is not a forgetful hearer but is a doer of the work, this one is blessed in what he does. Whoo, I got to hurry. Man, I'm finishing this tonight if I just stop in the middle of a sentence. Because I want you to understand healthiness is you get in the Word and you begin to live the Word. You allow the Word of God. Don't just hear it. Don't come to church on Wednesdays and Sundays and just hear the Word. No, you got to begin to implant it in your life and begin to do the Word. I want to point this one thing off. Quit hearing a message and walking away dirty. Quit reading the Bible and walking away dirty. Allow the Lord to cleanse you through His Word. But look at this last line of verse 25. It's after a comma, and I'll start. Let me just read all of 25. But you that look into the Word, and you continue in the Word, and you're not a forgetful hearer of the Word, but you're a doer of the Word. Watch this, this last clause. This one will be blessed in what he does. In other words, my blessings comes from my connection to the Word. Mm. What we want is if I sit in church every Sunday, if I pay my tithes every Sunday, if I'm able to make it on Wednesday and endure 45 minutes of teaching, I'm going to be blessed. No, you're going to be blessed when you're absorbing this every day. And I don't just mean money in the bank. I'm talking about you have a different attitude, you have a different makeup, you have a different perspective, you have a different everything begins to change. And because of that, your perspective has changed. Now your money looks different. And the way you use your money looks different. Amen? So realize your blessings are connected to how you are obedient to the word. Mm, are you blessed? I'm not even going to look up verse 26. 
If anyone among you thinks he's religious and does not bridle that tongue of his, he deceives his own heart. His religion is useless. Boy, James, he seemed, oof. Jesus must have beat him up as a little kid. Listen, you reckon Jesus said, I'm the Messiah, bow down and worship me, James. None of them believed until after the resurrection anyway, by the way. You know that, right? So listen. You are religious, but if you can't control that tongue, your religion is worthless. Woo, one of the hardest things in the church are people, do you know how many fires I've had to put out how many relationships I've had to try to heal, how many people I've tried to keep in church because somebody's tongue who called themselves religion destroyed somebody. I almost, listen, when my wife and I first got married, you know, I was pastoring a church as a single solo man and the women just thought I was their man. Not in a weird kind of way, but you know what I mean? I, they, they, they had ownership of the pastor. All of a sudden, there's a woman who now has ownership of the pastor, and they didn't like it. And my wife had never been a pastor's wife. She had only been a member sitting out there. She didn't know the glass house and all the nastiness outside and behind the scenes of a church. I, I'd tell her every, sometimes she'd come home from church crying, mad as a snake, and I'd be like, you ain't saying nothing. Uh-uh, I, I'm about to show them. I, and it was, there was three or four old ladies, and they were mean. Oh, my goodness, they were mean. It's a wonder she didn't say, forget you and Jesus, after all the nasty she saw from the church. And I said, no, no, honey, you, you're going to control yourself. You're gonna, in this house, in this glass house, you can't say nothing. But isn't it a shame that a new pastor's wife is being destroyed by people's in their 40s, people's in their 80s? I mean, ridiculing, condemning, destroying. Oh, my goodness, it's a wonder she stayed saved. Hey, she was testing. I'm glad she loved me with all her heart. I've been single again. Or I wouldn't have been pastoring. I don't know what I'd been doing. Verse 27. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is this. Here, here, here's. Wow. James wrote it pretty simple, didn't he? You want to be healthy? Visit orphans and widows in their trouble. Keep yourself clean from the world. Let me real quick close with one more thing. And this is not going to be long. Flip over to 1 Peter. Oh, well, there's something here I wanted to tell you. I'm going to do this at the end if I have time. I had this little sticky note because I felt like I needed to add a little bit more. <laughs> I don't know why I did that. 1 Peter chapter 1. Let me just give this. Are we healthy? Let's look at 1 Peter chapter 1, and I'm going to begin reading. Well, I think it makes more sense if I begin reading at verse number 13. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 13. Therefore, gird up the loins of your mind. We've already talked about some of this. Be sober. Rest your hope fully upon the grace that is to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. Verse 14. As obedient children, not conforming yourselves to the former lust as in your ignorance. In other words, you're not going to form yourself to what you did when you were a sinner. You're not going to go back and, 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 and begin to form yourself around your familiar spirits. But as he who called you is holy, you also be holy, uh -oh, watch this, in all your conduct. Not just in your church life, not just when the preacher's around. <laughs> you know, you've heard my stories about walking up on a, on a porch, somebody smoking a cigarette, and they trying to hide it behind their back because they, the, didn't, they didn't know I knew they smoked. I mean, just because you smell like a cigarette when you come to church, you ain't got to hide your cigarette. You ain't got to hide it. I see that smoke blowing over your shoulder there. Or the one time I was on another, I was on another back porch, and this girl was talking about... Um, some place that you got to taste all these fancy drinks, tequilas and tequilas with mixes, and I don't even know drinks, y'all, so I, I don't even know. But, and all of a sudden, all her family was like, 
And she just kept on. She didn't even get the hint. Shut up. That's the pastor. Quit talking about us going to the bar. Hush. Mm. She forgot all that I was there. She just, I came in a little late, was real quiet, eating birthday cake. And she was talking about all about her, her bar stuff. Mm -mm. No, no, no. Hey, we're told you got to be holy in all your conduct, right? Got to be holy in everything you do, even when the preacher ain't around. Even when that church member ain't around. Even when that deacon and that, that, that elder's not around. Because the God who called you is holy, so you got to be holy. The Bible says, verse 16, it is written, Be holy, because I, the Lord, your God, am holy. And then, I'm going to read this. I ain't even going to preach it because i got to go. Therefore, chapter 2, lay aside all your malice. Lay aside all, malice, by the way, is the desire to do evil. Lay aside all your desires to do evil. Lay aside all your deceit. That's a line. Lay aside all your hypocrisy. Lay aside all your envy. Want what somebody else has got that ain't nearly as good as yours, but because they got it, you think it's better than yours, so you don't like what you got, and you want what they got. Your man ain't good enough, so you want their man. Your job ain't good enough, you want their job. Whatever, whatever. Your position ain't good enough, you want their position. Envy. Get rid of it. Get rid of all evil speaking. Quit talking so bad. Let your mouth be a reflection of Jesus. Let the word of your mouth be a testimony of how you're saved and redeemed. Amen? Now, I know sometimes in your car, I got mad at a little old lady. And I knew it was a lady when I was behind her. I didn't even have to see her. I did look when I passed her to, to make sure I was right. She pulled up, trying to get on the interstate and all this construction. She stopped, and there was, a, there was 16 miles between her and that 18-wheeler. And I knew me and her both could make it. And I was like, come on, lady. Go, lady. Hey, go, lady. Boy, she got on my, she went, and I went right behind her. And I pulled up, and I went, yep, you're an old lady, just like I thought. Turned her blinker on to get off the construction. We wasn't getting off the construction, little old lady. It was just, it was yielding back into normal driving. Turned the blinker on. I said, turn your blinker off. Good grief. Anyway, get rid of all, I know sometimes people push your nerve, and your mouth just can't hardly help yourself. You, you, you got to control your talk, Amen. A healthy church, a healthy church controls their evil speaking. Verse 2, be as newborn babes, desire the milk of the word. It seems like James and Peter, they just keep on talking about the, 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 the word, don't they? So that you can grow by the, a healthy church is drinking the milk and growing into the meat of God's word. Verse 3, if indeed you have tasted that the Lord is gracious. Oh, let us begin to desire God's word so that we can grow. It is much healthier for you to put good mama's milk in a bottle for your baby to drink more than it is Mountain Dew. I know some of you, mom, I've seen you put Mountain Dews in your baby's bottle. I'm like, what are you doing? I mean, that's between you and your mama, but that baby's going to have bad teeth and all kind of problems the rest of their life. Don't do that. For those of you watching on the internet, Take Mountain, don't even give Mountain Dew to your kids, period. That sounds like Lester Roloff, don't it? Lester Roloff, he'd have preached, he preached against coffee, caffeine. He probably would have sent you to hell <laughs> drinking Mountain Dew. I ain't even kidding. Desire the word of the Lord. Desire, God, grow. If you know the word is going to grow you, mature you, and bless you, why are you not in the word? I've, it's going to grow you, it's going to bless you, it's going to give you security, it's going to clean you. Oh, don't forsake the word. So let me close with this. Titus chapter 3 verse 8. Those who believe in God should be careful to maintain good works. These are good and profitable to men. A healthy church is faithful to good works. Whatever you do, stay faithful to good works. You better stand. I got five minutes. I probably could have gone over that one little blue sticky note I put in there, but I'm going to forego it. Father, I thank you for health. I thank you, God, that I really believe Rising Fund is truly a healthy church.
But I know, God, there's things in my life through over the last five weeks that I've been convicted of. Lord, I know there's things that as the pastor of the church, there's things we as a corporate body need to work on. I pray, God, that each one in this house would be faithful to their health in Christ. I pray, God, that we'll be faithful in the word so that we can be blessed by the word, so that we can work the word, so that we can see the benefits of living in the word. I pray, God, that you would allow us, Lord, to be people that will shine such a bright, glorious light of the gospel that people are drawn to the cross and are saved because of our living testimony. I pray, God, that you bless the Rising Fawn Church of God. Bless us indeed. Will you enlarge our territory and expand our coast? I pray, God, that you'd keep your hand on us. We don't want to sin against you. We don't want to create evil, cause harm. Help us to be healthy in Jesus' name. Amen.